so at this point in my story, the year is 1999, and I'm 25 years old. Both me and Eva are roughly the same age. And we've, I have my master's degree, and she has her bachelor's degree. <clears throat> and up until this point, we sort of had full faith in just doing, you know, just accomplishing what you're supposed to accomplish. That degree is going to be magic, right? You're going to get a great job. You know, at some point, I stopped, I, I stopped, I started seeing even during the end of my studies that I wasn't really going to to enter into a company with a nice, with a you know, uh, management position or, or something, or director position because you still have to work your way up, even if you have all the degrees and even if you have years of of sales experience. The last couple of years of of university, I was working for a software company. It was kind of a clunky software, old software that was basically just people calling from around the world and just filling license orders. It was very basic and easy, which is which is why I kept it. It paid well enough, and and I was able to focus on my studies. But of course, when I graduated, you know, I had to up the ante a little bit. You know, one of the things that that I find interesting looking back on my life is that. Most people, when they go down this path, they want that house in the suburbs. They want that mini mansion or the Mick mansion, I guess they called it back then. You want your two Volkswagens and that mini mansion or even just a nice house in the suburbs, not to pick on it. I think it's beautiful. I think it's wonderful. But I never wanted it. I don't think Eva did either. I'm sure she didn't either, as I remember it. We felt that, I'll speak for myself, I felt that it was a trap, that once you buy that house, buy those cars, you have all this debt, these monthly payments. There's no chance of adventure the rest of your life. Like, that's it. You're just like all the neighbors. Your life is just like everyone else's. And so it's kind of strange that I went down a path where I was going to work alongside these people in the typical office environment, but I didn't want their life. So I don't know what I was thinking, actually, actually back then. Um... And the other thing happening at that time was the dot-com bubble. It was like a gold rush. If, you, if I had gone to San Francisco, forget the MBA. If I had gone a year or two before, just go to San Francisco and join one of these dot-coms, I would have had stock options and, and had a chance of, of making some real money. But I had so much faith in getting my degree and you know, obviously not, really, not realizing that the dot-com bubble would eventually bust. And so with, by the time I came out, it was kind of toward the end of that easy to find some kind of job, but I was in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and and I, I got a job with a interesting software company, kind of a kind of a startup doing something something new in, in the world of structured data. And for some reason I thought that this was the future and, and I had all kinds of potential with this company. And they were a, uh, they were a division of another company based in Seattle. Uh, it's called Data Channel and no longer exists because they went bankrupt. But I probably shouldn't have given the ending away there. This is probably not the interesting part of my story here, but just to give you kind of some, some background. So now you're out of college and we don't want to buy the house. I didn't even want to buy a new car. We had a car that was paid for. What we decided to do is pay off our debt because by this time we had, I don't know how much student debt, probably 30000 or at least $25,000 in student loan debt. And then another fifteen, twenty thousand in credit card debt. So a pretty substantial amount of debt. And what we decided to do is to drive around a dented car rather than fixing it, and to to remain living. At this point, we're renting an apartment because we had sold the the condo for a ten thousand dollar profit, and it just felt like renting something because we were kind of planning to probably move at some point. Colorado Springs is a great place, but probably not the ideal place to live forever if you if you're planning you know your career ascension although I probably could have done I, I guess I didn't really want to work for the large corporations another interesting point because I could have easily just gone to MCI or something and just you know done done the corporate thing I guess I always kind of like smaller companies uh, so I, what I've done really my whole career since then even is still now working for a relatively small software enterprise software which means you sell you sell to, to big businesses, but you, you aren't one. You're, you're a team of a couple hundred people. You have a pretty cool application or or platform, and you try to get you try to sell that to very large companies like like Shell, Apple, Starbucks, whatever. And it's a fun it's a fun job, and that's what and that's what I what I 
what I've been doing my entire life in different forms. I'll get into that as we go. Um, so after about a year in Colorado Springs, and, and I had a lot, I had a really nice coworker named Debbie, um, older older lady in her in her fifties, close to retirement, and my boss was also in that around that age. And I remember when I interviewed when I interviewed with him, I went to his house. He he used to he used to do um, I don't know what you call it, but uh, when you fly loops and you fly the biplane and, um, gosh, I forgot what he called it, what he used to call that, but he'd go out every morning and fly his plane. And he was a really unconventional, kind of a military type guy. And I was so nervous, you know, this coming with my, my suit and tie over to his house and, and, his, and I was, you know, nervous. And I remember one, one funny thing I said, it's funny how these things stand out in your life that you say, you say these crazy things and it just sticks in your mind. I said, oh yeah, that's, that's second hand for me. <laughs> and I meant to say that second nature to me or something. And I said, yeah, it's just second hand. And I kept saying that. And he was such a nice guy. He never corrected me. Or I said, and then in the same interview, I said, I said, I did a complete 360. And he said, you, he said, well, if you did a, if you did a complete 360, I think you mean 180. Cause that means you change directions. So he did correct me on that. So I was a kid still, I'm 25. I should have been a lot smarter probably. <laughs> but I guess none of us really ever, ever are. My, Another boss told me in the previous job in that in that silly software company I described before, this old, really old guy, kind of vulgar Greek guy who comes from New York and would visit us, and he said, "He said, you're an idiot, you're a total moron." I'm like, "Excuse me," he's like, "You are, you'll agree with me. Just wait a year, and then think of yourself now, and you'll agree with me that you're you are at this point you are just a complete moron." <laughs> So he was trying to make a positive point that, you know, we all grow and we all learn and we change. Um, but it kind of scared me when my, when my, you know, I guess sort of boss came and said, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Um, yeah, there's all kinds. Of, I mean, that's the thing about about these these office jobs. There's so many funny stories when you're with people all day. And so long story short, at some point, I had the opportunity to move to Seattle. Uh, the company paid for the move. And I, I was scared. You know, I had some friends in Colorado Springs. It was home for seven years going to college. And Eva didn't really want to leave either because she had she had her her life there, you know, friends from college that were still around. But we decided it's time to move on. I had visited Seattle a few times and stayed downtown in beautiful hotels and had amazing food. The food in Seattle was just unbelievably good. The best in the world as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, you know, let's make the best out of it. So we moved to Bellevue and that's where the company was based across the, across the bridges from, from downtown Seattle. And we got an apartment there we rented and Eva got a job at drugstore.com as a buyer. So we were kind of hooked up. I mean, I had a, I had a, so my job was in inside sales. At some point I even managed the inside sales team already at age 25 and Eva was a buyer at a corporation and, and of course beautiful young woman very popular as they, as they tend to be in the office and we were making good money we made so much money that that we just saved her income I, I started telling you before about Debbie the old lady in the other office um, she told me she said you have to be saving so that you have six months in case you, you lose your job in case everyone loses their job and I was like, six months? Okay, I, I, I kind of saw, I saw her point. So she kind of set me on the path of saving. And I know that losing a job is real. I've lost a job. I lost that job at DMA uh, before, that computer re, re, uh, reseller, because their business model just went, just died. The margins went, went dead on, the, on computers. And I remember, I didn't even know unemployment insurance existed. No, I, I went home and I thought my life was over. I have, I have like, you know, a few more years of university left and I have no job. And I, I started crying and, and panicking. And I called the CEO of the company and left him a voicemail crying and begging. <laughs> oh my God. And the, the, the nice man called me back. What, a, what an amazing man with character. And he left me a voicemail and he said, you know, there's unemployment insurance. <laughs> I was like, oh, so I ended up making like, you know, 75% of what I had made anyway at the job um, until I found something else. 
So, so losing a job is a real thing. It happens to everyone, even if you're a good employee. But in sales especially, you, you can't be sure that you're ever going to make your quota. So losing jobs is, is a real thing. Um, so we were on the path of saving money. We started paying off the student debt, paying off the credit card debt, driving the same old car around Seattle. Yeah, we did some fun stuff. I mean, we went to restaurants. We we had some fun. We lived in a reasonably decent, you know, new apartment. And we and just being in Seattle is just so amazing. It's just it's just beautiful and the energy and and the hipsters at that time it was just all these all these kids with their with their, you know, thick rimmed glasses and their cool funky shoes and the hipster sort of thing and the music scene like I, I was a huge music fan by this point. And basically every band, every indie band that I that I liked would come through Seattle. Um, gosh, or some of the Kings of Convenience, strange one to start with, I guess. Uh, Radiohead I saw a couple times. Um, whew, what else did I see? Balance Sebastian came through Seattle. Um, it's funny how I start to forget all these bands, but really anybody... I was always looking, reading the indie rags, the the stranger, the independent um, newspapers to find out who's coming. You know what's the latest album from which band, and just a huge music fan. I was playing a lot of guitar at this point in my in my bedroom, but I never thought about like finding a, you know someone to play with and starting a band. I I just kind of played alone for some reason. I guess I didn't feel like I was probably good enough, but. I was a good, I, feel, I think I'm a reasonably good singer um, and a good songwriter. Or even back then, I started to write some pretty interesting songs. But really, on guitar, just kind of strumming mainly. So I'm not really much of a guitarist, but hey, as a, as a front man or something. But I just, and I should have. I was young. I should have tried to start a band. But, you know, I was in this corporate world thing, and I just probably felt like it wouldn't fit. Um, but I could have. Did I not because of Eva? I don't know. I don't know. We were very close. Um, we had another couple friend, Miriam and Derek. She was, and funny, both these couple, um, two, two different sets of couple friends. Her, Eva's mom had known her mother, right? So her, their moms introduced us when we became friends. But they became good friends. We, we'd hang out almost every weekend. We would party and listen to music and talk and talk and talk about everything. Um. But I'm skipping ahead a little bit because something else happened around that time. The very first year that I was in Seattle, and that was 9-11. I remember being in, in the shower, and Eva comes in and says, something happened, to, there's like a war or something, The planes hit the hit some plane hit the Twin Towers. I'm like, ah, okay, that's interesting, whatever. I didn't get it, I didn't see the images yet. And then for like the whole world stop, I went to work, but nobody was doing anything. We we're just sitting there watching the news the whole time. And finally, after an hour and a half, they said, just go home. It was, it was like everything just stopped. The world just stopped. We sat there and watched TV like a bunch of zombies for three or four days. And it's funny. It's hard to imagine now because now, you know, all, all kinds of crazy stuff happens all the time. But back then, the 90s were so... Our, li our lives until then were, so were sort of so normal that things like that didn't happen. And the news just, you know, just used it to, to instill all this fear, um, this idea that Muslims were did it to us and they're bad. And what's happening? What's next? Where's the next terror attack? What are we going to do? The whole world stops. What, what also stopped is the economy. You know, it changed. Something changed. Around that same time, I think it was the, the, the dot-com stock market crash. And the company I worked for was very wasteful in their spending. They had raised $45 million just a few a year or two before and ran through the money and didn't have many customers, like two customers to show for it. So I lost my job. Um, well, I didn't lose my job. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, we got acquired by a different company from Boston. And I was the one of the team that kept my job, but I was no longer a manager. It just kind of felt like the 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 bubble had burst a little bit, and 
I didn't like my job anymore. I never really did. I never really did like like working in the office very much. I always felt like I'd rather be more free. You know, so what was I what was it all for? You know, what was the the dream from since, you know, since I was a kid to get in that degree and 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 going into business. Now, you could I could have gone to other into other professions. I could have been a scientist or or a doctor or something else. But again, what's it all for? It's just you sacrifice just to sacrifice some more. So you go into debt just to sacrifice spending the money you're earning to pay off the debt. And even if you're successful at work, that just means you have to work more. And if you get a promotion, you have to act like a manager. And, you, you know, you are you have to, like, perform in a sense of fake. And, and I also, during this time, I started going on, on business trips. Now, that's a, that's a wild experience for someone who grows up from a small town, in a small town, and from a lower, lower middle class family. You know, you can imagine my dad having his speech um, problems with the cerebral palsy, um, you know, being, being a custodian of a, of a janitor of a building. My dad wasn't able to sort of form this, this personality, this normal man personality in me. So my brother and I, I think, I think we just kind of took our, did ourselves. We kind of became a little bit different from people just because we didn't have that overbearing father um, trying to make us act like like he does. He just let us be however we we are as far as personality wise. Didn't learn really any any. Just, we learned basic values. You know, we learned about saying you're sorry. We learned about humility, and that was their biggest lesson: is who do you think you are? That was what I got as a kid. Whenever I got a little bit cocky, a little bit sure of myself, they would knock me down a peg, as my mom used to say. So that's fine. And that's, and that's, it's I, being humble is extremely valuable and important in life. But you also have to have confidence if you're going to hang with CEOs and, and VPs and go on business trips and spend five days together, 24 hours a day. You have to be able to fit in in that world. So playing golf is a big one, but I've always hated golf. I never even tried it. Just the idea of it, because everybody who played golf in college, go, I play golf. I'm, I'm a normal businessman, you know. It's just a faker. It's one of these people that have the house in the suburbs and the car like everyone else and says all the same things like everyone else. And I don't know why. I, I don't know why I was so averse to being normal. But... I guess it's a combination of two things. Like I said, growing up the way that I did, but also my international travels. I knew that that culture is sort of a choice. It's not some kind of inevitable thing. Whereas, you know, I, I question culture. I question, like, why do these people live this way? Um, I started questioning things. I, I've always questioned things. But, you know, when you... Uh, by this point, I've, I've traveled to France, I've traveled to Greece, I've traveled obviously to Slovakia, uh, and that Central Europe every year. I've seen, you know, Budapest, Prague, and spent time in all these places. And as part of a family, and, and, and as with a partner of, with someone who thinks differently because she's from she's she's from a different culture. So I never fit into my own culture. And business travel was just something that I was just I just hated the attitude, the, the people's, the ego, the business people in the airport and their, their coldness and their dead hearts. And I'm not, this sounds bad. I'm just, I'm, this is the honest story of my life. I, I, I carried so much like sort of bad resentment or something toward the whole thing. And I also didn't like to leave my wife, didn't like to leave home. It's funny now. I thought, you know, being away for a couple of days was I, I would dread the I would dread a business trip for for a, for a month as soon as I know it's coming and I, and I still feel the same way now <laughs> just not like on some micro level but you know it's funny you think you think you're going to become a business person and, have, and be able to stay in nice hotels and have a company pay for everything your flight and your food and everything else 
and you'll be somebody. You'll be that important person who walked through the airport dressed well. You'll be that person who had that food at that restaurant with that, at that table with those people. And what you find out, and I never dreamed about that too much, but I, I, I never thought it would be a bad thing. But what you find out is, is it kind of sucks, or at least when you're young, it's a shock. It's a, it's a brutal shock. It's a good thing because it is a challenge. I'll tell you about a funny, a really funny story. Um, back with that first job in Colorado Springs, I guess one of my first business trips, the first two, I was a wreck. I was a nervous wreck, literally. Um, I remember one time we went to Reno to, to a casino and I was carrying all the marketing stuff and all the boxes of stuff and I was just sweating profusely and just standing in line feeling so awkward and nervous. I don't know why. Like, oh, what do they think of me? What does everybody think of me? How do I, what do I say when I check in? I was literally getting my MBA and I was that retarded. And I remember a colleague came to me and said, are you okay? <laughs> kind of embarrassing. Funnier story than that, though, is a trip to Dallas um, just to see, just to go to some kind of a small conference and we had, a, um, we, we had, we were supposed to meet in the lobby at a certain time in the hotel and drive together to the conference. That's, you know, and apparently I had set my alarm wrong, lesson learned. Always call the front desk and get a wake-up call. Don't just rely on an alarm, on just one alarm. Well, nowadays you can with your phone, but back then. And I don't know where I get the call, but it wasn't the wake-up call. It was Debbie saying, where are you? We're downstairs waiting for you. Now, what I should have done is said, I will be there in 10 minutes. I'm sorry I overslept. Instead, I panicked completely. <laughs> my heart beating and I'm running around. <laughs> I didn't even comb my hair. I threw on my shirt and pants. And within three minutes, I was downstairs ready to go with an apple. And I didn't have any breakfast. Oh, she, Debbie gave me an apple because she knew I'd, I had overslept. And we go to the event. I'm still waking up. I'm panicking. I, I, my, my mind's not there at all. And I meet people. I shake some hands awkwardly, of course. This kid, this stupid kid. And I, and I go to the to the restroom at you know 10:30, and I look in the mirror, and my shirt is buttoned completely crooked. <laughs> Button down shirt. I was just, oh, I was a mess. I was just a wreck. And then. Of course, you have these experiences, and then every trip that, that you have coming up is you're worried you'll do the same sorts of, sorts of ridiculous stuff. I was always ridiculous, but especially when I, when I cared what people thought about me. I remember also in Seattle, Eva used to go to fancy hairdressers, and of course, I, I should go to a fancy hairdresser too, right? So I went to the same one, and... I don't know how things work there. You know, I usually go to just a regular hairdresser, but this one, they gave me a some kind of a an apron to put on, but like kind of covering your your whole arms and front and and you know it's like 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 a shirt and a changing room and the changing room threw me off because I thought, well, why is there a changing room? I guess I should change something. I should take off. I should take off my shirt. I guess. So I put it. Put this thing on. I tied it in the back somehow. My back was completely naked. Hairy, you know, at that time I wasn't shaving my back. So it was a very, you know, kind of hairy, not very, a little bit of hair in my back. Okay. <laughs> and my hairdresser was this beautiful Eastern European. I mean, gorgeous. And I come out with it like this moron without my shirt on, going to this fancy salon, sit down, and she, and they're just laughing. The hairdressers were just laughing at me. And she said, "Don't worry about it. It happens all the time." Of course, it doesn't. Of course, it never happened before. So I I was always the one, you know, that just would do things a little bit off because I just didn't have a I didn't have that much experience growing up. My parents didn't like people. My parents didn't have any friends. Nobody ever stayed at our house. So even though my grandparents had their stuff together. That's probably the only the only saving grace. That's the only time I saw. And then, of course, Eva's family. So if it wasn't for that, I would have had no chance of surviving and, and doing that and, and crossing the, 
the class barrier, I guess, from, you know, simple lower, lower middle class to sort of upper middle class people that you're hanging around, let's say. On top of that, I was trying to be, I was like an indie person. I was like, the craziest thing is that the whole Seattle thing, I just went through the craziest journey because early on, like I said, 9-11, well, it took me a few weeks before I started questioning the, the official narrative. I, I, start, I was smart enough that I didn't believe that Building 7 just collapsed. I didn't believe that they found a passport of someone in the rubble. I didn't understand why they why the buildings were in free fall. It was kind of obvious that something was going on that they weren't telling us. So that, for the first time in my life, made me ask big questions. It That was my awakening. That was my awakening. And it was painful. It was painful for years. It's painful to be part of a country that you no longer believed in. It was painful to be part, you know, the whole business world I thought was completely corrupt. I mean, the business world, you know, that's the media, right? That's everything. And I'm part of this. And they're lying. And... George Bush, the you know he I started to hate to hate, I mean I was already a liberal right, but I hated George Bush and that whole administration, and especially when they started the, the Iraq War stuff that Iraq is guilty of nine eleven we, when we all know it was supposed to be um, Osama bin Laden who has nothing to do with Iraq it didn't even make sense, it was it was an obvious lie. It was obvious so that people would either comply or they would awaken. But either way, they were ruling with an iron fist and they were going to establish the Department of Homeland Security, which merged all the military together under one corrupt organization. They were going to invade Iraq. They were going to continue invading the Middle East. They were going to do whatever they wanted to do anywhere in the world under the justification of terror, 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 9-11, 9-11, 9-11. And it was completely obvious. And it was so scary at that time because freedom had gone. My country had changed. It was no longer the good old USA that I had known. It just wasn't. One time I said something at work that I don't believe 9-11, I don't believe the official story. And a colleague said, you better shut your mouth or I will call the CIA or the FBI on you and report you as a terrorist. So my country was going in the wrong direction and I had to, you know, pay the bill. So I kept on doing my, my job and, and acting and I never said anything, at least officially. I said it at home. I said it to friends. I, I debated. I just debated everybody. I became this, this big debater about truth. And I thought naturally it's because of the conservatives. It's because of the, it's because of the Republicans. It's because of, because of George Bush and, and, and all the conservative business people and everything else. So I became a communist. <laughs> I read the Communist Manifesto and I started thinking like communism, you know? Um, culture in Slovakia wasn't so bad in 1993. It was only a couple of years after communism. People were, were valued family and tradition and and... Every, and, and you know all the I started seeing good things about communism, even though oh freedom doesn't exist, but that's just one minor detail. Okay, so I was confused. I was I was I was exploring things. I was exploring a lot of things. I was exploring all kinds of ideas. You know, I basically what happened is is um, I spent my whole life up until up until nine eleven, learning the official narrative, learning. You know, the, the official story in the textbooks and in the media and believe it, believing it. Why not? Why would I not believe it? It's my country. I haven't seen any major lies yet. Um, sure, there's some, you know, sure, Bill Clinton's corrupt in some ways or whatever, but it's not that bad. And then 9-11 and I'm like, and I'm like how, how can I justify that that this happened and this is happening and, and it's, it's not going away? It's not being exposed, even though there there were independent 
radio shows in Seattle. And there were internet sites that were revealing the truth. There were chat sites I would go to every day when I'm bored at work or when I'm done with my work. And I became radicalized um, as sort of a truther. Open mind about everything. That's when that started. Right after 9-11. And it continued for some time, for some number of years. And I wasn't happy, as you can imagine, with a different set of beliefs from everyone else. And even Eva thought I was a little bit over the top. And I was depressed. I was depressed with the routine, taking the bus every day to work, sitting in an office, in a quiet office, hearing clicking sounds on keyboards, and then going home and doing it all over again. I... I missed traveling. I missed family. Uh, basically, it was, my life became a work a work camp. I I wrote a book at that time about myself, just a story about myself. Made fiction, right? Um, dreamed of being famous. I played my guitar. I read interesting books. Listened to interesting shows. Went to awesome concerts, had awesome food. Had that one couple friend. But I was depressed. And Eva wanted me to take Prozac to go, you know, to go to the to a psychologist and get a prescription to, to fix it. And I said, no. What we're gonna do, what I want to do, is what I've always we've always talked about kind of in the background, is someday spend some time in Europe. I said, you know, whenever I'm there, I'm happy. Before we, I know we have to do something, Eva. We have to buy a house. We have to, we have to have kids. I mean, we never, we never even talked about kids yet, really. And we're, you know, I'm talking about the years between, between 25 years old and 30. So these five years we lived in Seattle and never really saw a way to have kids or never really wanted to. We were too busy being selfish. Typical, you know, liberal, far left liberals, to be honest, uh, which was cool, right? That's cool. Went to John Kerry rally, you know, went to the caucus, did, you know, communist me, <laughs> atheist communist me. But I wasn't happy. And I think a lot of atheist communists are probably not very happy <laughs> because it's a it's a miserable way to exist to think that all that's real is what you see, uh, what you can buy. All that's real is what you, is the vacation you can go on, the status you can attain, the correct opinion you can have, you know, ego identity stuff. And the questions of your eternal soul, the question of life after death or what happens when we die is just something you avoid which is easy when you're young because that's so far away. Um, I thought the world was so messed up that I don't want children. I thought that would be the right answer. Just this world is too messed up. I'll just be selfish and I will not pollute the environment as much as possible. I'll be good. I'll be an ideal. I'll even buy a hybrid someday and change the world. But in 2003, 2004, it didn't feel like that was going to happen. It felt like the conservative side was winning and the military violence was winning and the lies were winning and the terror, terror, terror was winning. And I just wanted to get out of there. I couldn't, you couldn't go anywhere without the damn news lying to you on the TV in the service station or in the restaurant or wherever you go, there's this damn TV in the wall turned up. Propaganda everywhere and the only person seeing that it's all bullshit i didn't know anybody else in, in my real life i didn't see a future but i i didn't plan to leave forever i just thought well let's at least get out of here for a year maybe we just we just go for a year and and eva being from slovakia you know her dream was was to come um, to come to America, 
right? So why would she want to go back to Slovakia? That's kind of a failure in her in her mind. We weren't coming back as huge successes or anything. And but I convinced her that, honey, I really want to do this. It really means it's, it's everything. I need to do this to be okay in my life before we move forward. I don't know, buy a house, have kids. We have to. We still have to grow. We still have to do this as part of our life story. You know, what if we go for a year? We we saved at this point. We we paid off all of our credit cards, and we saved like fifty thousand dollars. You know, all the debt paid off, debt free, and and we, and we had fifty thousand in the bank or more. And life in Slovakia was pretty was really cheap back then, so we could easily spend a, a year and live and live in an apartment here and pay for it. And, and, and just come back, right? It's not a huge risk to spend some time, travel Europe, explore your relationship with your wife and her family, make new friends, have some fun before you dive into like the real adulthood. You know, we're 30 years old, by the way. We should have already been adults, to be honest. So it's a process. It's a long process. We had to do all the, you know, apply for my residency, go through all this and plan a lot of details find you know put everything in storage it was like it was like a a one year process from making up our mind that we're going to do this to actually moving and during that time i started to to value my my job <laughs> strangely enough like i always thought like oh, i'm just an inside salesperson i'm nobody i want to be a ma- i want to be in marketing i want to be a manager or a director or a vp someday this job here is nothing but then I started to think to myself, like, well, I need this money. I can. What if I just do it? Do a really good job with sales. What if I become a really good salesman? And and, and learn these skills and and enjoy it, and and accept this is my role. This is what I will do well. And so, even though I wasn't really motivated because I thought that I was leaving the company in a few months, I was like, well, this is easy now. I'll just do the job and I'll just be grateful for whatever time I have left in this in this life. And over here in Seattle, um, and just try to enjoy it. And I learned then how to have, have a positive attitude toward work and enjoy it and have fun with it and, and create value for the company. And what happened toward the end, we didn't want to tell our, our, tell the, our employers that we're leaving because then we, they would just let us go. But you know, the week that we're leaving, the very week that we're leaving, I had an idea. I said, what if I tell my boss that my wife has an opportunity in Europe and I'm going, is there any way that I could keep working for the company from there? And and back in 2005, that was pretty radical because we had just gotten voice over IP technology, like just brand new. I had this clunky system with all these machines and telephones and cables that I could bring my my American phone number over to Slovakia because they had the broadband was start was starting to pick up over here and I could receive and I could make calls as though I'm in Seattle it was a radical idea it was a crazy idea at the time and my boss was like huh well you're doing a pretty good job lately we'll we'll give it a shot Sure, we'll keep you on. We'll see for at least for a few months to see how it goes. And I said to, to Eva, here's an idea. Why don't you go to your boss and tell them that my husband has an opportunity in Europe, but I can keep working here for a while? Same story. So we played like a diversionary tactic. And I'm not proud of this. So it wasn't honest. But hey, we're a playful young kids still, right? We walked away making a Seattle income, you know, well over $100,000. I think, I mean, 125 or something like that back in 2005 combined, right? With, with savings, <laughs> with no expenses, and a, living in a cheap country. Now, so I guess that's a good place to probably stop this talk number four. The Seattle years, I'm sure I left some stuff out. I'm not trying to cover every detail of my life. I'm trying to tell the interesting parts the best I can, the background that need, that seems to, that will make sense later. 
I didn't talk about our relationship very much. And there were some things that happened that I will tell you because I want to talk about sex and relationships and things like this in the next talk. I hope you're enjoying this or getting something out of it, maybe feeling like you're not crazy because I'm maybe crazier than you. I hope that's what you're feeling. But don't be afraid to reach out to me if that's what you feel also. I'm doing this out of love because telling the truth is love. It's the same thing. You cannot truly love if you're not able to be free. So freedom is the same thing to tell the truth. And the truth doesn't have to be just the the nice, the nicey nicey stuff, the, the, the yay, yay for Jesus sort of truth, but it can be the ugly stuff. Because any kind anytime you tell the truth, what you're doing is you're aligning with reality. So you can add reality as a concept right down to right in with the idea of love, good, truth, God. When we hold back our honesty, now our loving honesty, our careful, loving honesty, when we hold that back, a lot of bad things happen because we fall away from the good and become deceitful. And we're going to go into that in the next talk also. All right. Thanks.